Hey folks. Hi folks. Welcome to this photo life. It's March 11th, 2021. My name is Andy McSweeney and I ask you this, how is your photography? How is your life? How is everything in between? Good and steady, I hope, or at least on its way there. It is all a process, whether it's the photos or the life, and I wish you well just from the top of the show. And I also hope you enjoy the show because, dearie me, oh boy, who do we have on the show today in interview season? <gasps> the one, the only, huh, the David Duchemin. Yeah, that's right, photo educator, photographer, podcast host of Beautiful Anarchy, and so many other things that make him such, that basically make him such of a Buddha within the photography thing, that I am uh, lost for words at the beginning of the show to say anything more about how amazing my guest David Duchemin is. Because he is amazing, ladies and gentlemen. He's one of the few photo voices that I've led into my process over the years as I've worked things out in my little bubble of creativity, not taking voices in too far, other than just getting influences, ideas, and then picking them apart and making sense of them on my own. In fact, we opened the interview with that, where I, like much of the episode, end up getting a free photo therapy session with David on the whole process of being a photographer in these modern times, as well as, of course, David's story, what he's going through as a photographer, and so, so many other things that I am shocked that we got away with in the hour and 16 minutes that I spoke with David. Now, I will let you know, for you new listeners, the usual rules apply, even if it is one of the Buddhas of photography like David. It's on the loose and chit-chatty, so there's no super tight structure to things. I jump on top of them and give them a breath with my own babbles that I hope are informative and push the information and discussion along. And of course, I clean things up in the edit a little bit because we are talking for the very first time and on Skype across nine hours of time zones, no less. So there is a little bit of editing going on, but it's only really for clarity and uh, usually cleaning up my over babbles and stutters and whatever else I'm working through as I go through the process of being a podcast host. And I must say, actually, before we get to the interview, David really does deserve top marks, and it just shows what an amazing speaker he is, just generally, as well as on the photographic front, that I could do all this mishmash of uh, looseness and on the groove. And he just rolled with it so beautifully. In fact, you'll even hear that uh, we talk about not being too precious with the work, whether it's photos or otherwise. So we're going to get to that fairly quick. I'd like to keep the intros especially short here in interview season of this photo life. And particularly when we get someone like David. I mean, you're not tuning in to listen to me, are you, boys and girls and otherwise? <laughs> So let's just get on with things, shall we? The only thing I will remind you before we get to uh, things properly with David is, of course, this photo life has been going for almost 50 episodes now. It's certainly not the first interview we've done here on the show. So do please, through any means possible, feel free to check out this photo life. We have some interviews with names big and small. You can go through the list and see who's on there. You can also check out some of my solo episodes where almost as a total opposite of David and his short, concise talks on photography, I go bibble babble on the loose and shaky shaky, but all towards just exploring creativity in one way or another, whether it's photography or otherwise. And I have to throw down that necessary plug so that you're aware of it just in case. So feel free to check out this photo life at Apple iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or as I mentioned, your favorite podcast provider. We should be out there. And if not, you can just swing by my site, andymcsweeney.com, which is of course linked in the description. So you can check all that uh, babbling out in whatever way, shape or form interests you. Oh, and hey, don't forget, we also have a YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Andy McPhoto. There you'll get pretty directly to the interviews because we're posting those there with shortened intros and outros in most cases. And uh, while you're there, I guess you can check out my other videos, which include my weekly show, Andy's Photo Show, broadcast live every Sunday at 8 p.m. Central European time from the beautiful city of Bruges. All right, enough plugging. We just hit five minutes. What the hell is this intro going on for 
for so long. Oh yeah, that's right. So that I can justify uh, a little bit of marketing in all this and then get uh, it all deducted on taxis. So boys and girls, why don't we get to it? Let's chit chat with David and see where it falls. And I just can't believe I got him on the show. Whew. All kind of like staring into the sun and getting a beautiful, rich golden suntan from it. That's how I felt. Let's see how you feel. And let's get to the interview. Ladies and gentlemen, David Duchemin. Uh, I have a bit of a bubble process with my work in the way that I take in outside influences, but I try not to let them in too much because once I get the idea, I kind of want to cultivate it in my own bubble and, and Petri dish at hand. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, we've all got our processes. And I think uh, there are, for me, there are places within my process where uh, I really isolate myself and I don't expose myself to other influences. And then there are uh, parts of the process, you know, I kind of look at it as a wave. There's mountaintops and there's troughs and there's bits in between. And and there are times when I just completely inundate myself with every kind of influence I can find. Mm. And uh, you know, there's, it, there's no one size fits all process for any of us, even for ourselves, what works for me today may not work for me tomorrow. And you've kind of got to be, uh, you've got to be able to take the highs with the lows and uh, really adapt. You know, if it's not working for you today, don't push it. Just, you know, try a try a different approach. And do you find it's like a, a an on off sort of thing where you take time on your own and you're really excluded from outside voices or do they mix and match a little bit? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, they certainly mix and match all the time. Everything's so fluid. There's no hard dividing lines between things. Um, I wouldn't say my creative process is on and off. I would say what it looks like is different from day to day. But I, I from the minute I wake up until the time I go to bed, I look at everything as creativity uh, or con- contributing certainly to creativity you know the the thoughts we take in the things that we think about the things we expose ourselves to and like i said some days it's uh it's more intentional that you are increasing your inputs and your reading and you're exposing yourself to other influences and other days it's purely about squeezing the sponge and getting everything out and you just sit down and you write all day or you photograph all day and you're not you're not thinking even actively about those influences but they do they form sort of part of the gray matter out of which our best ideas come. And I don't think you really need to go looking for inspiration. If you've got a really healthy, active inner life, um, those, those things will bubble to the surface at the strangest times. So I really see it a little bit like a sponge, you know, I'm always, I'm always letting it sort of soak up everything around it. And then, uh, also always kind of giving it a good squeeze because that sponge can only hold so much, right? So you can't just, accumulate, 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 um, without having a a release valve. So every day I'm pulling in information, inputs, influences, I'm looking at images, I'm reading things. Uh, and every day I'm working in some way, every day I've got hours set aside to write something or in more active times when I'm traveling, that's when I do my photography, you know, every day is a day where I'm out from morning till dusk with my camera good and that makes total sense that makes total sense you know you've talked about it before and um and i dip in and out of research before guests i try not to know about them too much although with you it's a little harder because you've been a voice in in my process do you think that adaptability and like you talked about the sort of fluid state of things comes from your background in comedy and improv I think, yeah, I think partly, I mean, I did, I did comedy and improv in some way for 12 years professionally. And when, when you're sort of thrust out onto a stage and it's like, okay, you have to entertain these people for 90 minutes, go, uh, you know, very well that oh, in that 90 minutes, not everything is going to go to plan. And you learn to stop taking yourself too seriously. You learn the basics of, of improv itself. For me, it was more improv with an audience than improv with the people on the stage with me. Uh, but things were always going 
uh, I hate to say going wrong, but certainly <laughs> they were not meeting my expectations. You know, an audience mm -hmm. member would say something or I was primarily a prop comic. So I did things, I did juggling and magic and escapes and unicycles and all that kind of nonsense. And things were always going wrong. You know, you would drop things or a prop would break or you'd forget a line and, and you, you had to sort of learn to not take yourself too seriously and yet also see if you could make the best of it, you know, and in, rather than there be a moment where the audience was thinking, oh, well, this has gone off the rails um, and it being a negative experience, they know it's gone off the rails. They can see it. I mean, you've just dropped whatever it is you're juggling. Big deuce. <laughs> Call the moment, you know, and make it fun. Uh, make it part of the show so that half the audience is going, did he drop that in intentionally so that he could just just so he could say that line or there, there is, a, but it's. I think it's more than just my p past in comedy. I think when you've been making your living in creativity for most of your your life, I mean, certainly all of my adult life, I've never really had a a real job. Um, you learn to to sort of roll with it and and trust that if you show up to work every day and you, you allow your you know your skills to get better, you you become adaptable. You just learn to sort of, you learn that half the gold, if not all of it, is found in the mistakes and the missteps and the things that you think, you know, oh man, I, that's not what I was trying to do. I think more often than not, I mean, evolution on a, on a big scale comes out of mutation. It comes out of the, the missteps and the adaptation to that. I think those are good things. They're gifts. And they're really hard to deal with at the time when you've got like really clear expectations in your head about what this project is going to look like or what today is going to look like when I go out shooting. But if you can hold those fairly lightly, uh, I have found that the gold is where, you know, they, they in military circles say no plan survives contact with the enemy. Mm -hmm. I have found that to be true of creativity as well. You know, all, all our best plans are really the way that they ser best serve me is just getting me out there to work. Once I'm working, the uh, all bets are off. You know, and I come home at the end of the day. Usually, it's it's not well. That went exactly as planned. <laughs> usually, it's huh. I had no idea that I would encounter this moment, or that the light would do this, or that I would come up with this idea, and that would lead to this. Like for me, it's all about the the discovery. You know. It should be. It should be. It's it's great that you talk about the looseness around it, or at least how I'm hearing it, because I'm I'm going through this phase right now. And it's been well, it's been there a long time, but I think I didn't recognize it. And now it's just conscious and, and I'm pushing it through where I'm I'm a chaotic person. I didn't warn you that this podcast is a little chaotic. I'll talk over you. Perfect. I'll ramble on a little. I'm all about I'm all about chaos. Yeah, yeah. Part of why I caught attention of you was the title, Beautiful Anarchy. I'm like, hey, I get that. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, man, um, I've kind of embraced that chaos without obviously letting it run loose and, and wreck my life because you got to have that balance. But I've noticed with creativity, the more you embrace that chaos and understand it, tame it, make it part of the process, work it through the more you're getting forward. I mean, I can give examples, but please, your thoughts are also welcome. Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, I look at the chaos as this beautiful kind of, like that's the nature of things just in general. Creativity is messy and you mm -hmm. can either bang your head against the wall trying to uh, avoid the chaos, trying to snap everything to a grid of your own expectations, uh, or you can look at this as an opportunity to find, I mean, cre for me, creativity is an opportunity to find meaning and maybe bring some pattern to the chaos, maybe bring a little bit of order to that chaos. But usually it's not, usually it's more like bringing meaning to the chaos. It's kind of recognizing the beauty within the chaos and excluding every, everything that's otherwise kind of noise. And uh, certainly in, in my photographs, you know, I, I increasingly I'm trying to include, uh, if you look at the span of my work from the last 15 years, my compositions are are more complex now because I'm allowing a little more of that in. But it's still the big question is how much can I allow in before the whole photograph falls apart? You don't want to lose simplicity. Yeah, you don't want to lose simplicity and you don't want to lose the impact, right? With I sort of look at things with the, the increase of information within one given frame usually means the decrease of impact. And so there's a balance, depending on what you're trying to accomplish in the photograph, there's a balance. And if you cram a lot in, 
all of those extra elements, they can only do so much and hold attention for so long before things kind of fall apart. Um, but the chaos itself is is necessary, you know. And, and even if it wasn't necessary, what are you going to do about it, right? Like, <laughs> You're screwed either way. I'm very zen about this stuff over over the last twenty years. You know, yeah. what do you really? What are you going to do about it? I mean, you can fight against it, but it's still going to be at the end of the day. You're not going to have made a dent in the chaos. Yeah, this last year's proven it. Hey, it's twenty twenty one. We've seen that. Some forces are greater than us. You might as well stop panicking and get on with it as much as possible. It's not comfortable, you know, and the chaos out there, especially the uncertainty. And I, mm. you know, I'm always talking, if you listen to A Beautiful Anarchy, my podcast, you, I, I'm often talking about the fact that creativity happens in uncertainty. And uh, I think it's like the universe calling my bluff on on <laughs> this stuff last year. It was kind of like, yeah, you ain't seen nothing yet uh, <laughs> in terms of uncertainty. Like it has, it really has kind of ripped the, the blindfold away from our eyes for a, a lot of us, you know, we're, we're planning to do this and we're planning to do that. And yeah, we talk about, you know, improvising, but we do it re within a relatively safe set of confines. And this last year was kind of, for me, it was this exercise in uh, refamiliarizing myself with how, how truly wild uncertainty can be, you know, um, because all of uh, I mean, all bets were off last year. It just became, and, and this year actually, I think this year is even a little bit harder. Because at least the last year, I was I spent the year reacting to things, and I had plans, and then I was canceling them. Well, I'm going into 2021 with nothing. Like I've never looked into a calendar year before and gone, hmm. wow, it is just like it's it's an echo chamber in there. It's you know, you open the calendar, it's like hello, hello, hello. <laughs> There's nothing there because because I just I have nothing on which to base any kind of plans. Or, so it's it's actually forced a complete reset for me. And uh, my finger's still on the reset button. You know, I just I don't know what it looks like yet. Yeah. Well, man, you know, I want to talk about that looseness a little bit more because I think this this interrelates. And if nothing else, I'm getting I'm getting a little free phototherapy from David Dushman for the hour. So mm -hmm. I got to I got to come back to that briefly. But, uh, you know, I've been doing a series uh, from past guests on the show and checking in with them in 2021. Just briefly, do you mind sort of recapping uh, what went down with you as this all sort of settled in, I guess, around March, like much of the Western world? Yeah, we uh, we came back from. So I spend uh, have spent for the last twelve years uh, almost every January in Eastern Africa, mostly in Kenya, but often with in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And so I came back from. We came back from East Africa at the beginning of February ish, mid mid February, and settled into what we thought was a good period of time, you know, to do other things to do. Uh, you know, you go out and you make photographs, but then you have to have some time set aside to do something with those photographs, whether that's building monographs or putting it into books or printing, whatever. Um, and so I, I sort of, I had that, but then I had a number of conferences. I had workshops. Uh, I probably had six events in 2020 that I was looking forward to, not just in terms of teaching and being with other people, but in terms of being other places where I was making new work. Uh, I will very often, if I have a workshop in a place, I will use the fact that I'm going already to that that place and I'll do my workshop and then I'll spend time uh, before or after working on my own work. And so all of a sudden my, uh, my year was completely <laughs> free of all of those opportunities that I otherwise would have had. So I haven't I haven't really picked up my camera for almost exactly a year. We got back and I, I immediately ordered two new camera bodies, very excited about, you know, the next year. And uh, apart from making some videos with one, uh, um, I haven't even taken the other one out of the box. Uh. Uh, but, I, but photography is not my only creative pursuit. And I don't need to be out making photographs in order to enjoy working with photographs. Um, and, or teaching photography. So I've spent this year, I built a couple of new courses. Uh, I released a book when, when all of this started happening uh, in 
North America, it was kind of like March 16th, 17th was the day everything just kind of <laughs> went, you know, um, official or <laughs> yeah, the doors all got locked and somebody lost the keys. And uh, <laughs> yeah. March 17th was the day that that my latest book, The Heart of the Photograph, was slated with the publishers and Amazon and, and booksellers around the world to to go on sale. That was like that was the launch day. Ah. And these things don't just change just because there's a worldwide pandemic. So it it probably was the least auspicious day I could have chosen in in my lifetime to uh, you know to have a book uh, released to the world because all of a sudden Amazon was focused on other things and uh, things that m might otherwise have taken a day or two to get to people that were excited about this new book. Suddenly it, they were sending me emails going, well, it's three weeks and I'm still, Amazon says it's, it's still coming sometime. And uh, everything got pushed out and people in Europe, they normally have to wait too long anyway. And suddenly they're waiting, you know, an extra month or two to get the book. Mm. So it kind of, you know, there was this gigantic expectation and excitement. I, I thought this was one of the best books I'd written. I think it's a culmination of a lot of things I've been teaching. I've, I think I've, I've gotten comfortable enough with teaching this stuff and my own thoughts that this is a particularly good, uh, good book. And, and uh, so I had this big balloon and March 17th came along with a big, big needle and kind of popped that balloon. Um, and, and so it's just been, you know what, it's been uh, a much, uh, it's been a much more day-to-day -day existence, you know, I, with the exception of picking up the pieces from uh, a book launch that sort of stretched much longer than a book launch normally does. Um, mostly my efforts have been sort of, okay, I've got today, you know, let's pick up the shovel and start digging and see where, where we get to, mm. uh, on this or that or the other thing. And so I've doubled down on my podcast and just kind of trying to focus on creating great, uh, great stories for a beautiful anarchy. Um, as well as uh, my other, you know, my big paradigm for business is gather an audience to yourself and then serve them like your life depended on it. You know, make, it's personal for me and make it, make a personal connection. And so I've got a, uh, an art, a, you know, a so-called newsletter and every photographer in the world's got a newsletter of some sort. Um, but I send one out every two weeks. That's, uh, it's new content is never regurgitated. And it's, uh, it's my primary way of offering new ideas and thoughts and encouragement to, to my audience. And, and I have decided that, you know, in the absence of any other way to serve them and to teach and help them on a biweekly basis, I'm putting everything I've got into that. And, uh, and then also because, you know, there wasn't enough going on, Andy, I decided that uh, I was going to, this was the year I was going to finally stop bitching about it and just dump social media. And so uh, mm -hmm. it has been an interesting journey without social. I've never been quite, I've never been so happy, frankly. I believe you, man. That stuff is mixed feelings. Yeah. It's, it's really, it, you know, I wrestled with it for so long and often very publicly and I think everyone sort of breathed a sigh of relief and like, finally you stop talking about it, <laughs> uh, especially on social because I'm not there anymore. Uh, but as a result, my connection with my audience has become much more personal. There are fewer of the, you know, the, the sort of I don't want to say flippant or trite uh, comments, you know, when people just use an emoji to kind of express one thing or another. I think those are very sincere, but they're not particularly deep. And. Uh, because I'm not on social now, a lot of my correspondence has gone to either comments on my blog or uh, email. And email is, as a medium, it's a much deeper connective medium. You you really can't, unless you're sociopathic, you can't reply to a three-paragraph email with uh, an, an emoji, you know, a thumbs up yeah. emoji. Yeah, that doesn't uh, work that way. It doesn't not. Yeah. yeah. And, and that email is th when someone writes you three paragraphs or, you know, some of these emails people send me are really long. Um, it's uh, it, it's a point of connection. You know, they're pouring themselves out and yeah, it's it does at a certain point it's not scalable. I mean, how many emails a day can you answer? But I try. I try at very least to send something that says, "I'm sorry, this isn't a longer reply than it deserves." But you know, and I and I take a couple things out of the email they sent me and try to give them, 
try to give them something, you know, try to make it a bit of a gift. And so the year that was looking really empty all of a sudden has filled itself with these little points of light, you know, these little connections with an audience that might otherwise only have seen or interacted with me on social. Uh, now a lot of those a lot of those people have just sort of decided that if I'm not on social, I'm not worth following. And that's, that's fine. You know, I clearly have outlived my usefulness to them, but a lot of them. That have should just also, come... Oh, I'm Go sorry. Ahead. I jump in. That's part of the, the chit chat. I get going. Uh, that must be part of the catharsis is actually of dumping some of that dead weight. You know, you want people who are actually as passionate as you, if you're creative, you want people oh, to, to, to go, wow, yeah. I feel this too. My blood is rushing also. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. And actually, you know, in a, Oh, I've, I've, I'm, I'm going to just, I'm going to dump in Go a question it. if that's cool, that brought the chaos. Uh, well, that also, that's interesting. I mean, I, I read about how you talked about leaving social media and such. I found that one particularly fascinating. It's a, it's a topic on the show that comes up a lot too. I've noticed talking to photographers because we have to weave that in. And I guess that's why I wanted to talk about On the Loose more because it's, it's, it's a set of features that I find for a modern photographer, but that's, that's a little later. If we get time, obviously it's all chaos here, uh, but <laughs> The main thing, I guess, is is did you find that the emails, that the the comments on the blog, the way that you were rebuilding your connections to people, because you're you also run workshops, which is actually what mm -hmm. I was thinking about with the year, and what I hear a lot about from from a lot of people doing well in the photo game, and I feel it from having photo tour Bruges. I've been going eight years. I've had I've had some good runs, and it's built up. But last year, I had five percent of my normal business. Mm -hmm. Uh. I guess what I'm getting at is, is how is how is the emails and and comments doing as a methadone to that in contact human person side of things for your creativity? Hmm. Well, it, it's a poor substitute. You know, they mm. I, the kind of the I I have a number of levels to my business and and the teaching that I do, and you know, some people will take advantage of what I teach. Uh, purely, you know, the freebies and mm. they'll just, they'll read my stuff and, and it's just this broad platform of people who enjoy what I give them uh, and are happy to stay at sort of the, this is a gift level. And then there are others that will once a year or twice a year, or as often as I put them out, buy one of my books. And yeah, eventually there is a, a sort of a, a core group of people that come on my workshops. Um, probably the, the culmination of that is the safaris, the safaris that I do in Kenya every January. Mm. I have a, a group of people that just keep coming back. There's a very small percentage of them that are new um, because it's like we have this incredible bonding experience where these people have become friends. Um, you know, I've, I, the closest friends I have in my life are the people, including my wife, are people that have come on these workshops with me. They're very intimate. They're very, you know, you can conduct a very impersonal workshop, mm. but I, I figure if I'm going to spend a week or two with someone in the Indian Himalaya or, you know, in, in Kenya somewhere, we may as well become as close as we possibly can. And so after that, you do become close. And to replace that with email is uh it's it's not the same <laughs> so you know mm -hmm. i've been i've been on a lot of zoom calls this year I, I actually set up my basement studio to to do really nice like good looking zoom calls uh so when i go down to the basement to have a zoom call you know it's properly lit and it's it's i do a zoom call through a uh, Fuji mirrorless camera and, and, you know, it's a set with great audio and great video. And I, I'm now doing, um, this is kind of beside the point, but I'm now doing, uh, a, a weekly or several times a week virtual lecture to camera clubs around the world. I was on, oh, really? uh, on, on oh. yeah, I was on with uh, a camera club from Luxembourg, uh, just a couple days ago. I've got three this week cool. that I spend, you know, I spend 90 minutes with these camera clubs. I've got a lecture that I do. And, um, so that's been sort of unexpected. It's been a way for me to, to kind of reach a new audience in a different way. Um, and then of course, you know, then there's all these people that I, I'm not seeing on workshops and many of them, we're not doing teaching stuff online together. They're not calling and saying, Hey, you know, let's, let's do a, a an image review. They're calling and saying, Hey, can we grab a glass of whiskey and just have a chat? Oh, that's awesome. 
Yeah, so that's been really that's been really great because ultimately you you have a glass of whiskey for an hour with someone and you're going to touch on all kinds of different ideas and struggles and victories and defeats and and at the end of an an hour everyone leaves much richer and more encouraged. So yeah, that's been interesting. It doesn't answer your email question, but um, it does. It does actually because I can I can. It's all about connection, right? It's got a and it comes in different ways and. There is a point, of course, at which, you know, you kind of get zoomed out and you're like, I just want to sit and answer a couple emails and you can still give the, your email can still be a gift. It can still bring a level of depth and connection, um, you know, and certainly more than it usually did for me anyway on, on social media. So that though that isn't to I don't want to um, make it sound like I'm, I'm kind of crapping on social media. Social media it was at one point incredibly important to me and I made incredible mm. connections. But those connections have just simply grown beyond the point where social media is the best place to have them. Well, it's kind of in its teens right now, isn't it? So it's reaching this difficult stage where everyone's a little bit I guess awkward is the easiest way to put it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if it's in its teens. I, I, I kind of, I, I think it's jumped the shark entirely. I'm looking to forward to something, um, whatever the next iteration is. That's kind of like a post-social world because it's become too commercial. You just, there's no, uh, there was a time when you know there was organic reach and people got your stuff because they followed you and. And now it's just become a, the medium has changed so much that I just, I don't see it being as connective. It, they're still selling a promise that was true five, six years ago, but it's just not, it's all ads. And I don't know, I got to a point where I was just, I was done. And again, it was less about I'm done with social media. It was just more that I was hungry for a deeper connection. And I know that that can be found in other ways. And we don't, you know, the glue that holds us together is not Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because I find that the, the the channeling of the Internet into Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever's next. Chat house is the next big thing where you can all have a conference call and that social media. 15 seconds of TikTok. It's it's it, it breaks up the simplicity and it breaks up, uh, I don't know, focus for us to do our jobs, too. Not to mention mm-hmm. floods the market because of these EXs. And in a way, man, that, unless you have some thoughts, obviously, that brings to, uh, to the next point of, um, of just what makes a photographer in the modern age. You know, the creativity, the technical, but I've always, I've always said, and I, I make loud credit of it, especially around Valentine's Day, that my wife doing the accounting is part of my business as a modern photographer to make sure I don't go bankrupt or not pay mm-hmm. my taxes. Mm-hmm. What do you feel makes up a modern photographer in, in as many slices as you feel like sharing? Yeah, I well, I mean, first of all, not everyone agrees with me. I'm very democratic about this stuff, and um, <laughs> I, I think you know there are people, there are photographers out there that spent, especially of the the van, you know, the the old school, the the ones that spent a lot of money on film gear, and they went to film school and they cut their teeth, you know, mm. shooting as a stringer for a paper, and uh, there are there are those that look out at the 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 proliferation of cameras and photographers, you know, walking around with iPhones and, you know, grumbling and saying, oh, everyone's a friggin photographer now. And uh, I, I say the same thing, but I say it with a very different tone of voice. I think it's fantastic. I think we should celebrate it. I think, you know, every new photographer is a new opportunity for us to listen to some. I mean, do you hear you don't hear poets going, oh, man, there's just too many poets in the world. Um you know, the more poetry, the better. And the mm-hmm. fact that someone else is making poetry doesn't threaten or uh, really have anything to do with your poetry. It, it, it just simply, at very worst, it makes more noise. And those that are creating signal will will have a tool to cut through that noise. But I, th- I think the camera is this incredible thing that collaborates with us to see the world in a different way and experience the world in a different way. And some people use it for all kinds of things I will never use it for. You know, they're off making collage art and mixed media and and some, you know, some just use it to document their families and some, yes, they want to make a living with it. There's a, there's a gamut <laughs> that, uh, you know, sort of represents the the spec. I don't know the spectrum of of what it means to be a photographer mm-hmm. is so broad and so universal that these days, I I kind of 
I think the, the label, I am a photographer, has become uh, meaningless. I think the question is, okay, fine, you're a photographer. That's great. Uh, what do you do with that? What problems do you solve? What itches do you scratch for people? What value do, do you bring to the world? What are you making? You know, Is this contributing to a richer life for you? And, and how? Uh, whether you can, you know, you go into these forums, which gratefully I don't visit very often. Um, <laughs> and people are, people are arguing about, you know, well, that's not photography anymore. That's digital art or that's, who cares? Who cares what the label is? You know, yeah. the question is, I because let's face it, if that's your badge of honor, well, I do real photography. Oh, good for you. Does anyone beyond you actually care? Is this solving a problem for someone? Is this introducing, you know, new ideas into their life or making their life in some way more beautiful, more rich? I, I doubt it. I doubt that label means anything to anyone except you. And it's probably standing in the way of you embracing other things like learning to tell a better story, like learning, you know, to, to fill a void in some other way. Uh, because yes, everyone is a photographer and the, the, the barrier to entry used to be the technique and the gear, and you had to be willing to invest thousands of dollars and all this time. And yes, it has become much easier. You arguably, there are skills that are going to take years to develop. I don't mean that it's uh, paint by numbers all of a sudden, but that barrier to entry is gone. And if you're, if you're as a business person, if you're like, if your business card is kind of based on, if your selling pro proposition is nothing more than I know how to use a camera, well, guess what? So does everyone. The question is, do you know how to use a camera to create a certain feeling, to tell a story, to connect with people, to, you know, to sell a product, whatever. Do you really understand that stuff? Because anyone can figure out one 500th of a second an F8. Anyone can figure out how to focus a camera. It's not rocket it, science. It's not. It's, and we're so precious about this stuff. And I'm like, if that's your badge of honor, you got to dig a little deeper. You got, you know, and no disrespect. There are people that have worked really hard to get there, but you know what? I mean, some people climb the mountain the hard way and some people drive to the top and park. Your experience getting there will be different. But to argue that you're not on top of the mountain because you didn't do it my way is ridiculous. Yeah. You mentioned precious. It's been in a sphere of thought over the last little while. Uh, do you happen to know Jeff Bridges, the actor, his photography? I do know his photography. It's so awesome with that uh, with that wide lux. I mean, it's a 70 mm -hmm. millimeter super panorama view for those of you who don't know and the look it up please i he says that a large part of his work is a lack of preciousness and you see it on his mm -hmm. website throughout his work with the music with the other stuff that's part of why i asked about you know what makes up a modern photographer i was thinking a little bit also in you know the aspects of like accounting social media uh, writing all these great books and opening up the creativity to the world at large as part of your career etc but the preciousness i mean that's that's something that's got to be there at all times in my opinion Enough that I won't shoot off into the advanced meta end of like the industry and all that, and at least not directly, unless you want to talk about that. But preciousness, really, uh, I've noticed also with the chaos that I mentioned earlier, the lack of preciousness, you still respect everything. And it's not about stomping, stomping on things, but really at the end of the day, not having any holy cows, are there? Yeah, you know, I, I, I kind of look at it as a, a reverent irreverence. Um, I, I love this craft and I love all kind of expressions of creativity. But at the end of the day, this is not about sitting around in a, you know, perfectly pressed white shirt with your cigar and waiting for the, you know, or whatever it, your picture of the ideal artist is, you know, mm. and waiting for the muse to bring inspiration to you. It, yeah, it, it's great. You've got your head in the clouds. That's fine. But uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, who's a social media thought leader, business kind of guy, he's always saying, you got to have your head in the clouds. Um, you got to have your head in the clouds and your fingers, your hands in the dirt. And uh, and as much as you've got big dreams, you got to work to to get them. And I I think the muse is like she's a working class, you know, she's like blue collar as they come, dirt under the fingernails, and and art and craft and and all of this. 
it's 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 a job. It's a, even even if you are only quote unquote just an amateur, and I don't think there's anything mere about love and about you know doing something f- just for the love of it. I think that's great. I, I it's still work. It's still a, you still show up every day and dig in the dirt. That's functionally that's what we're doing. And if you can still be precious about the whole thing while you're on your knees digging in the dirt, well, knock yourself out. But most of us just acknowledge that really and truly that's what we're doing you know you sit when you sit down to write when you sit down to paint you you know you sit down at the at the wheel to to make a, a piece of ceramic art whatever it is it, it's just it's labor it's blue collar labor you're sitting down and you're putting in the hours and you're putting in the time and i don't know where we get off being so precious about either our process or the end result of that. And at the end of the day, let's face it, even if you go as far as saying, well, this is about creating legacy. I love the idea of legacy, but it's not, you know, I'll be gone, you know, in 30, 40 years, I'll be gone. And my legacy, it's not going to last more than a generation or two. There will be some residual impact from what I do, but what we do, it's not that, it's not that important. We're not curing cancer here. Mm -hmm. And it probably would free us up if we, you know, like Jeff Bridges talks about just, you know, uh, doing what we do without the preciousness. And because the the specific individual moments of our day, the the very mundane stuff, that's what our life is comprised of. You know, we need to be focusing on those things and finding finding the, you know, what's really truly special about these very mundane kind of kind of moments in our life. Here, man, uh, just a question off air. Do you mind if I, I keep pressing on this? Do you want to go like a little bit hardcore? No, press, press. Yeah, no, you, you are, there's no preciousness in you whatsoever. We can really go for it. I, we can see if there's preciousness there, I'll beat it with the beat it with a stick. All right. It's that it just deflect. It's a welcoming place, man. If you if you would, if you hate this interview, there's no way it's going to be on air. So it's all good. <laughs> oh, it's, it's <laughs> I have a little man. microchip in my neck from Canada that forces me to have good manners, too. Perfect. Or, or, <laughs> or apologize in moments of lapse. Oh, man, I'm so sorry. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> all right. Well, Wait, um, let me just gather my I, thoughts a sec. Um, yeah. And I, while you do that, I, yeah. let me let me just say, you know, you sort of you were kind of you, you were hinting at, at a uh, a stream of thought about, you know, about the business stuff and what it takes to be, you know, a, a modern photographer. Yeah. And so I just want to pick up on that thread and say, you know, it's when when you decide that you want to combine your craft with commerce, it, it's almost like you you are really saying I'm going to take up a whole new craft. The craft of how we make photographs is. Um, it, it's important that we learn it and we usually obsess over it. Um, but then we say, well, I'm going to be a quote unquote professional photographer. I'm going to do this, you know, vo- uh, vocationally and try to make a, a living at it. That's when the moment you decide that you are not deciding, you just want to do more photography and more, be more serious about it. You are deciding to uh, shackle that one craft to a whole different craft. You're deciding, I'm going to learn how to be financially literate. I'm going to learn what uh, m- truly what marketing is about and what the opportunities to communicate with, to connect with an audience are about. I'm going to learn how to sell. And if you're like me, I'm going to learn how to sell in a way that doesn't make me feel like I have to, you know, scrub the stink off my soul afterwards. Because a lot of creatives have a very uncomfortable relationship with with the idea of selling, you know, and they say, well, I'm going to let my work speak for itself. Well, those are the people that their their work not only doesn't speak for themselves in the way they hope, but they're also still not making the living they wanted to because nobody's work, quote unquote, just speaks for itself. We have to advocate for it. We have to connect the dots with the people in our audience that otherwise might not. There, there are uh, there's a whole gamut, just like there is with the craft of photography, all these things you need to un- understand and un- learn how to apply in your own particular way. You've got to understand that being a professional photographer uh, means all of that. And for some, it might mean going super deep on social media. Uh, I did for years until it just wasn't the tool I wanted anymore. For others, it's understanding the incredible opportunity that having your own platform and I'm big, really big on this, Andy. If, if you are listening and you're a, a professional photographer or you have professional or vocational aspirations, regardless of what else you do with social and, you know, clubhouse and 
TikTok and all of these things, you've got to have a platform of your own because social media is changing so quickly and you cannot rely on, I mean, imagine you've got a, a million people on Instagram, that's your audience, and suddenly Instagram changes its terms of service and you go, whoa, I, I'm not on board with this anymore. Or your audience, your audience suddenly goes, ooh, you know, I, I can't, there, maybe there's some scandal at the top of uh, the food chain. Or, or even not, look at Google Plus, it just became uncool and died off. Google Plus is exactly the right yeah. example. So yeah, you've got, okay, good for you. You've got 10 million people. If you have not, over the time Google Plus has still been a thing, if you have not moved those people onto a platform of your own, if you can't separate from anyone else's wishes, <laughs> you can't reach those people and say, I've got something for you. I made this for you. If you can't do that, you're lost. You may not be lost right now, but uh, I mean, social media is young and it's and it's still evolving. We don't know what it's becoming. And there will be a time when something changes significant enough. Even just Facebook within the last few years changed its its algorithm so significantly, organic reach completely disappeared. Mm -hmm. If you want to get your audience's attention, it's really tough. You know, yeah, and they want money for it. And even then, the ROI on Facebook ads is not always very good. You got to really really know what you're doing and then that becomes part of that that whole separate craft i was talking about and are and you it, really it, willing it, to spend less time making photographs in order to spend all of that time researching what a good facebook ad strategy is all about I, you've got to ask that yeah exactly like you say you have to ask that and i was just going to jump in and say and then it all changes facebook is is like a different demographic than it was five ten years ago it started off as a university thing so, yeah. And that's, I guess, where it gets into like the whole the whole multifunctional side of a modern photographer, like I was kind of going at earlier. You know, it. I feel like and certainly this wasn't true in the old days, uh, or, or at least what wasn't true in the old days was like you just rocked up for an assignment, took your photos and walked out. Did you? You were an assignment photographer doing all this man humanitarian work. You have to mm -hmm. be resourceful. You have to be multitasking. You have to understand travel logistics, getting your fixer, dealing with people, all that sort of thing, especially the people side of things. And now it's in the modern age. I mean, you get social media thrown in front of you, changing platforms, different purposes for each. Then you get the podcast network side of things. Then you get the video side of things exploding. It It's funny. I mean, like, I enjoy a lot of what I'm doing. I, I get to take my photos. I have I have I have client work. I have I have uh, a decent audience. All that, this, that, and the other. Photo tour has been my main thing, with it, the exception of, of course, the situation right now. Mm -hmm. The rest doesn't interest me that much beyond doing this podcast and having chit chat. Mm -hmm. You know, my methadone right now is my live show on Facebook every week. Okay, uh, Facebook and YouTube. I do that. I go out, try, chat photos, talk about the last week, chat about something in photography or creativity. But at the end of the day, if you gave me the magic camera and said, go do your thing, I, well, I'd probably take up some of that humanitarian work you were doing and then just cruise around doing stuff I love with people and travel and all that. But the rest doesn't interest me. And it, just to rant it out and I guess get, get to the question, I find myself in this interesting place on top of it, having clinical grade ADHD, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> screens aren't uh aren't exactly conductive to that and that's actually a piece of therapy if it's if people are feeling it you know just turn off these bright screens a little more yeah so where do you i mean how, how are you supposed to feel as a photographer modern wise when you're happy to do the work you do all this stuff i'm doing all this stuff when at the end of the day all you really enjoy if you're in the professional side is well like me shooting and teaching and chit-chatting Mm -hmm. Well, I think I I think there's a, a a trope that has been pretty active for the last ten or fifteen years, and that's the whole you know do what you love trope. And mm. uh, there's there's a lot of danger in that. There's a lot of I I certainly understand. I've said it. I still say it, but it's uh, accompanied by a number of caveats. And one of those is you can also find love in what you do. I mean, I don't every day sit down uh, at my at my desk to do the things that it takes to run uh, what I do, um, you know, smoothly. There are things I just don't love doing, mm. but there are ways of a finding a, a way to do that in a way that you love. I, I've, I've off, um, 
that's the word I'm looking for. I've delegated a lot of that stuff. You know, if if I can give it to, you know, I have a business manager who does uh, a lot of the stuff that I, not only do I not want to do, but I, I don't want to do it because I'm not good at it. And I would much rather someone <laughs> do it and do it capably um, so I can focus on the thing that I'm I'm good at. But also, I think there's a pressure to uh, to just be good at everything. And look, I, I gave my I gave YouTube a shot. I did 70, 80 episodes of a, of a show and then went, OK, that serves its purpose. I'm going to try something else. And, and they I'm were great. I'm just going to give you credit there. Right. Let's stop the whole show just to give you credit on those episodes. Don't you dare move forward with that bet. OK, well, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, the, I, just because we begin something creative does, doesn't mean we have to keep uh, you know, beating it until it's dead. If if you're doing a YouTube show and you get to a point where you go, ah, it just isn't doing it for me anymore. You know what? Just stop. Do something else. I can go back to my YouTube show anytime I want. In fact, I've gained subscribers this whole time while I haven't been putting out any kind of uh, material. Um, but I haven't, you know, it's not like I quit and then said, okay, screw it. I'm going to take down my YouTube channel. There's still 80 videos there. People see them. They, they still come to me and say, wow, those are great. When are you going to do them? I don't know. I, I might, you know, maybe when I stop doing my podcast, I, at a certain point, my podcast, I'll kind of go, eh, you know, maybe this isn't the time anymore. There's just like social media, there's life is too short and we cannot possibly be good at everything. So I think you've got to look at what you do, what you love to do and say, okay, where does that all fit? And if you're not really loving Twitter, just get off Twitter. If you're not loving Facebook, just get off Facebook. Find a way to do what you do that is most suitable to your set of talents, gifts, desires, inclinations, whatever, and like double down on that. Do it really well, but don't do anything half-assed. I mean, there are people that I have conversations about social all the time because I think there's a hunger for people understanding you can actually uh, run a business very well without social um, because social just isn't the thing that it's promising to be. It's the um, gatekeeper right now, though, isn't it? Well, it it alleges to be the gatekeeper. It alleges to be so, but I would I would argue that there is a big people within social media believe that social media is the world. There is a huge, huge world beyond social, and I think you can run a thriving, thriving business without social. It, it will take some adjustment, uh, but I would argue that those that are on social and saying, "Oh, I just can't live without it," they're they're struggling. They're they're are reasons that their business is not doing so well. Social media makes us lazy. And if your business plan is, I'll just go on social media. If your business plan is Instagram, that's my business plan, you're in trouble. Because because there is a whole world of people out there that don't want to get their messaging uh, in a scrolling, temporary, I've seen it, I've clicked on it, I've liked it, I've moved on kind of environment. Hmm. So. I guess what I'm saying is, is yes, if you really strongly feel like you just love Facebook and you're seeing re return on your investment of time and money, energy, great, that's fine. But as a business person, if you're not seeing a, a strong ROI on whatever it is you do um, and you don't love it, don't do it. Find something else that gives you a stronger ROI. Find something because you will reap bigger benefits on something that you absolutely love and doubling down just on that one thing than on stretching yourself too thin over all of these different platforms and hoping something's going to stick to the wall if you just keep throwing it. It's just, I mean, it's a hope that I think that comes from fear that if we're not there, if we're not in these spaces, people won't find us. Well, you know what? You don't have to be on social for people to be talking about you. I, I check in on social just to make sure because I, I quit. I guess I quit about six months ago, but there are still people that leave me messages and I don't want them all just kind of hanging in limbo. So I'll log on and just make sure that there aren't unread messages. That's a different kind of social. It is. And, yeah. and, you know, and then I just say, hey, you know, here's my email address. Let's let's talk off off of social. But my numbers are still increasing in terms of my follower count and that sort of thing. Uh, not that I particularly ever cared about numbers, but that's just to say I'm not on it and people are still finding me. They're still liking my work. They're still commenting. And other, most importantly, other people, I don't need to be on social for someone else in, in Iowa to say to someone in California, hey, I just, I just read the, 
the heart of the photograph and absolutely loved it. And here's a quote and here's the picture from the cover. People are still talking about what I do in the same way as if I, instead of being, you know, uh, leaving social, if I had just died, people would still be for a while, they'd still be talking about it and they'd still be saying, this is a, a great book or I found this blog post helpful. So social can still benefit you even not being on social. You People will still find you. I mean, th that assumes that there's some kind of paper trail and that when people mention you, you know, you can Google it. Well, well, that's the thing. If I can jump in there, just um, I mean, you've done your time on social, so so you've gotten you've gotten that reward from that. And also, I guess this hits into sort of the multi multi hat side of the photography, whether it's working social media or otherwise, you've taken it you've taken it beyond photography and a lot of your work does talk beyond photography for anyone who happens to be a new listener to uh to david uh into creativity at large and and that's your payoff isn't it you've mm -hmm. taken it beyond just going and taking your photos and doing your assignments and this that and the other especially in the changing face of commercial photography you evolved yourself you evolved your work you evolved beyond even having to say the word photograph in in many of your talks mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, sure. I mean, that's why I'm curious where photographers end up. Social media is certainly part of it. And I guess I say it's dominant because that's where it comes into consumerism, connecting, connecting to your audience. Obviously, I don't want to undervalue that. But I mean, just the nuts and bolts of making a photography business and getting exposure out there. So so there's that. But do you I guess I guess to sort of lead it to a question, unless you have thoughts, of course, keep cut right in. It works both ways, dude. <laughs> um, but I guess uh, I guess how do you feel at this stage of your career where you've done your work, not in the finished sense, I can certainly tell there's more from you. But I mean, like right now, you've taken a break from photography, social media, you've accomplished some amazing stuff, man. I, you know, like I said, I don't have you on the show because I, uh, you're, you're famous and doing great. I want to talk to you as a photographer and you've been an influence. And I got ADHD. So, you know, especially with looking at screens less, you're standing out. How does that feel on your side of things? And where do you sort of go from there? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I don't. Well, I, yeah, my, I see a, a, it's a very foggy path forward at this point. You know, I see a couple steps. Yeah, I see a couple steps in front of me and and I'm happy with with uh, those focusing on those couple of steps. But for me, my, my big paradigm is uh, is gather an audience, let your work f find an audience for itself. I don't even think we necessarily go find an audience. I think the audience finds us. Mm. And uh, there are a lot of ways to do that. But the I think the important thing to remember is that we do not need an audience of a million people. And Instagram, uh, with you know the, sort of the very visible metrics of followers and likes and stuff, has made us all think very uh, lofty thoughts about the numbers, how many people are following us. But, you know, uh, there was a, an article written for Wired magazine several years ago now by Kevin Kelly, who was the at the time the editor for Wired, and it was called the uh, it was called a thousand true fans, and he posited that if you as a creative could find a thousand people that every year were were dedicated enough to what you did, that loved it, found value in it, that they would spend a hundred dollars uh, per year on anything that you made. That you could make, arguably, depending on you know your own level of comfort and what it costs for you to make the thing, you, you could make 100k a year uh, easily on that, and you could change the metrics. If you could find 1500 that would buy 150 dollars worth of what you create, you you would make whatever the math is on that. You would make more. You'd, you'd make more money. Sure, but it's a quantifiable system. Yeah, and it's but it's not that big. When you think I don't need a million followers on Instagram, what I need is a thousand, just a thousand people who are are so connected to me and what I do that have found value in the thing that I make. Then our effort, daily effort, can be aside from making the work, which is our first priority. Our daily effort can be putting that work into the world in the ways that we feel is consistent with who we are, what we like to do, and letting that audience find us. And we do not need to find a million people. We do not need to be beating ourselves over the head with social media if that's not what we want to do. You can find a thousand people. Your work can find a thousand people. That doesn't mean it's not hard. It's, it's actually probably much more work 
to find an audience uh, without the hope of social, but that audience will actually build. There will actually be people on the other end of it that that love what you do. In, um, Instagram and Facebook are terrible conversion tools. They're, they're not great uh, in the long run for lots of people want your free stuff and they want they want to click and they want to like, but they, it's not a, uh, they're not heavily invested in what mm. you do. And so to find people that are heavily invested in a medium that isn't about heavy investment at all, uh, is a real challenge. So if you're not going to use social, you're going to have to be out there dedicating yourself to a, some other form of connection. And that has always been the challenge with any business, uh, least of all the, you know, the, creative arts. I mean, we, at the end of the day, so coming all the way back to your question, I think if I remember it correctly, you know, my paradigm is just about finding an audience for my work and connecting as deeply as possible to that audience. And I believe that whatever the next incarnation of what I do, whether from, for me, that audience has expanded, as you noted, from photographers also to other creative people. Mm. But that came as a result of listening to my audience who kept sending me emails that I was not obviously not listening as carefully as I should have. And they kept saying, you're not just talking about photography, you're talking about life, you're talking about creativity. And finally, I went, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and so now I've made an intentional effort to to take that advice and that uh, insight and and actively get my work in front of people that are not just photographers, actively speak to people that are more generally that identify themselves as creatives or makers or doers in a more general kind of sense. But it all for me, it all comes back to we're speaking to an audience and that audience can be big. It can be small. It can be really big and not very invested or it can be small and extremely invested to the point where these people want to, you know, s spend, actually spend money to, to spend time with me, which blows my mind. I, I don't know why anyone in the world would want to spend money just to spend time with me, but you, you know, that's what this audience paradigm is all about. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know where it's going, Andy. I, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure, but I know that at the end that where it's going is really just a question of how. How am I going to continue to serve an audience that I've fallen in love with and would do anything for? I certainly won't do something that's out of character for me. I'm not going to kind of go, well, you know, if the audience wants this, this is that's not what I do. I just will keep making the thing I do and my audience will either continue to find value in it or they'll still switch out. You know, there's some attrition. Some people go, okay, this isn't really what I'm into anymore. When I, I went from a lot of color photography to a lot of black and white and I got some emails saying, yes, yeah, just your stuff is gone. It's a little darker than I like. And I'm like, great. You know, thanks for joining me for the, the time that you did. Maybe we'll see each other again in the future. Mm. But it's that audience that if you can, if you can, if you can focus on not not finding an audience, not convincing an audience to like your stuff, but just focus on putting your stuff into the world and then recognizing the audience that gathers around that work and serving them and, you know, loving hard on them. I think making a living with this stuff is a lot easier than than people make it sound. I think we complicate things. Oh, man, I really wish we had more than now. I'm usually a long form kind of guy. That's all right. Well, you know what? Tell you. Tell you what, let's uh, let's give it another uh, let's give it another ten minutes or so and give you give you a chance to ask a couple more. Oh, if that's okay, thank you. I, course, I also absolutely. have a quick wrap up question too, so so that's good. That gives me a couple go minutes. For it. I'm not tightly constrained, so let's go till t t uh, t twenty after. Okay, great. Oh, thanks, David. You're a star man. Uh, all right. Well, um, I might even leave that in the edit that David gave me twenty extra minutes. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> I didn't warn you about the bad jokes either. I kind of wanted to drop all this on you, knowing that knowing how you are with the work and everything. Dude, I did 12 years of comedy. I am no stranger to bad jokes. Oh, dude, that's part of why I wanted you on the show. When I heard you were in comedy for 12 years, I, I man, you know, I, I really found the, the, the definition of what I want to do with the interviews on this podcast because it more switches from like me babbling for a while to getting babbling with people. I want to I want to find the interlinking threads of photography and life. It was in the title and it just took me a while to figure it out. It all interconnects. I was a waiter for 10 years, bar, uh, bars, restaurants, the whole thing, silver service to, to like nightclubs. It's really helpful for the service industry of running photo tours and being a guide and educator and all that sort of thing. Or even just a photo buddy. You know, can I carry your tripod for you that little bit? Huh. We're all just people, man. All just people talking to people. 
Yeah, we're all just people talking to people. And that's also where I, uh, where I find it fascinating where we're at right now, whether it's social media or the photo community. I mean, like, I guess, I guess when you talk about your audience, I keep hearing community, which is a huge keyword to me. And if I was going to throw out anything uh, on the advice side, not to you, because, because man, you're on your way, you know about this stuff, but it's connect with your community, not just online, but locally. I mean, here in Bruges, we've got a fairly small city. It's quite self-contained. I stand out a little bit with the photo tour and being the guy from Canada and all that. But but the more I connect to my community, the more I notice the result of it. I don't know if there's a question in that, but if you have any thoughts, you're more than welcome. <laughs> well, you know, a community is almost in some ways, it's, it's, uh, it's just another word for audience. It's it's yeah. a group. Of, it's just a group of individual. An audience or community really it doesn't exist apart from the fact that it's a, a a group of individuals. And for me, everything's personal. And I don't think any opportunity is too small. It is unless I'm super busy. It's very rare that someone would contact me and uh, ask me to do a podcast. Uh, and me say, no, I don't look at the stats and go, well, you know, how many listeners do you? I don't care if you've got two listeners, that's two people that I can yeah. connect with. And in some way, if it's a good fit, enrich their lives and two people leads to four leads to eight. And I, I look at every individual as this opportunity to to create impact. And so, yeah, however you do it, you know, whether it's an online community or an in-person community. Every point of human contact is an opportunity. If you're going to be really cynical about it, yes, it's an opportunity to sell something, right? But I, I don't think selling is a bad thing. If what you create, you believe it has value and is going to make people's lives better, there's no shame at all in saying, I really want the people that I that listen to me, I want them to get the very most out of this. I want their lives to be better for what I do, for what I teach, for the art they put on their walls. And yes, I will give them opportunities to avail themselves of that just as when Apple says, hey, we've got a new widget to sell, I, I'm not thinking, oh, God, they're always pushing me to buy their stuff. I'm like, just shut up and take my money. The, the <laughs> money becomes <laughs> irrelevant because I love what they create. And, you know, for, for the most part, it does what I want it to do. And I want more of it. Just like if, if you, you know, my, I use this example fairly often. I look around my office and there are everything that I look at, somebody designed, somebody made, much of it is handmade. And uh, there are books that people spent years, in some cases of their lives, making photography books. And there were prints. And, and at no point do I sort of look at these things that I so love in my life and say, man, God, I, I sure begrudge them the money that it took, you know, in exchange for that thing. I don't. I'm just grateful that I had the opportunity to get my hands on this thing that enriches my life. That's when it's done well. That's what all commerce is. That's all selling is. It's a profoundly human activity. And even if money doesn't change, look, when I ask you to read my blog, I'm asking for a piece of your time. I'm selling you something. Even if, you, if money never changes hands, I'm selling you something and saying, I will give you these ideas in exchange for your time and your attention, which arguably is more important than money. We're very happy to waste people's time, but start talking about selling and everyone gets all, again, they get kind of precious about it. I, let's, let's be honest, if you've got value and, and you're offering it to the world and it's something really truly like, if someone sees $100 of value in it and you're only selling it for 80 bucks, hey, everybody wins. And you get to continue doing what you do. You get to make more art and and raise your family and put food on the table and, you know, <laughs> contribute to causes and fund cancer research. I mean, money is not this evil, awful thing that we should keep talking about as though it's the redheaded stepchild. It, it, it does beautiful things if we allow it to. And well, how can you take how how can you take a photo and inspire people if you can't afford a camera, you rent and staying alive? It's in it's in Buddhism, which I know you you sort of transmit a little bit of your work I've noticed through with wellness and and awareness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Buddha says you can't look after anyone until you look after yourself. Well, it's just it's a very strange paradigm. I think many of us were raised with a very uh, strange relationship with money, and mm. as a result, with uh, any of the activities that surround money, we certainly don't want to talk about it, and we get all weird when we have to. You know, I, I have a lot of conversations 
yeah, photographers that are like, I don't know what to charge for my work. I feel weird charging for it. Mm. And it, it has really, it has nothing to do with their work. It has, it has everything to do with the fact that they're just uncomfortable talking about money. Um, they don't see this as an exchange of value for value. If, if we were trading cucumbers for things, no one would have a problem with saying, hey, I make a million cucumbers a year. We'd all be like, oh, great, good for you. You have more cucumbers. Um, you know, it, it would just be a thing, but there's something weird about money. There's just something that we've been taught. You don't talk about it. It's not, you know, modest. Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry to cut in, but I hope it's relevant. That's part of why I miss Canada dearly, but I, I find my home in Europe. Money has a different priority here. And, you know, I mean, it's part of the, the comfort and decisions they make over here, but... Family comes before making cash. Six weeks holiday in Belgium, minimum. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. guaranteed in any job, even including welfare. <laughs> Well, you know, I it's, think it's, it's, it gets very, yeah, yeah no, go on, please, please. Well, there's different perspectives on money. And, and I, I don't know that we can just sort of blanket say that, you know, one culture values it more than another has. A, it's, it's really, I think, more about the personal relationship, about how willing we are, um, not necessarily to value it, but just to openly discuss our values about it. it it's, mm. I, I don't see a, there is no disconnect for me in, uh, being an artist of substance uh, who also makes a lot of money. I don't see a problem with that at all. I mean, it's making, you know, we make art, we make money. You can you can make really bad art. You can also make money in a really uh, ugly fashion, but you can make money in a beautiful way too. You can make money while significantly impacting the lives of others and use that money once you've made it to continually impact the lives of, of other people. And, yeah. and so I, I, I don't know, I guess there's not really a point in this, except that certainly if you're going to be a professional photographer at a certain point, you've got to wrap your head around the fact that money is, is a part of it. And you've got to become comfortable with the language of money and talking about money, because at the end of the day, it's just value for value. You, money is a, a store of value and, You've got to get comfortable with the fact that what you make is worth something. It's also got to be better for your creativity to to figure this stuff out, get on with it. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I have done plenty of work for free, not for training, but out of love. You know, like I'll give people even high res copy of the photos. Sure. If, they're, if, you know, we've had a good connection there, or they gave me a connect into, into getting into a place in Bruges, especially as I'm exploring the whole place. But the, it, it's... Oh, damn it. I it, lost my thought. It bounced I, out. Take it over, please. Well, <laughs> let, me, let me let me jump in and say exchange. This is the beauty of this paradigm. Exchanging value for value often means uh, exchanging what you make for money, which is a store of value. Yeah. But money is not the only store of value. And that's really important. Yeah. I, I have I have given my art away in exchange for time and in exchange for favors and in exchange for the opportunity to have impact, which has huge value to me. Mm -hmm. To simply say you should not give your way your work away for free, one negates the fact that art is a gift and your stuff should, even if money is involved, still be a gift. Uh, but money is not the only way to uh, to exchange this value, and I think we impoverish mm -hmm. ourselves when we limit this, uh, you know, cash to 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 being the only way that we are willing to accept value in exchange for what we create. There's lots of different ways for it. And ultimately the question is, you know, are, are you making something that's creating impact in the world? And is your life, are you able to keep doing that because of it? You know, that for me, I don't make money. Uh, I don't make art so I can make money. Uh, although that happens, I make, I make money so that I can make more art. I, I, this is for me an infinite game that I do this yep. only so that I can keep playing, not so that I can win as a mechanism end. to sustainment. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. Or taking it up if you want to. Sorry. Yeah. If, if I can, if I can put enough money in the bank that I can, uh, spend my days making more art and not going out and shoveling the driveways of my neighbors because I need the 20 bucks. I, that's more art that I can make. That's one more piece point of impact I can have with another person. And someone might actually make a lot of impact shoveling the driveway for another person. I got, God knows I don't want to shovel my own driveway, but I can make 
impact in my own way in a more significant way by spending that hour not putting my back out and writing an email to someone that really needs to be encouraged about th their craft or their latest body of work or, you know, their professional development as a, a photographer. But it's just for me, that's about impact. The, the fact that I'm making money in another way uh, allows me to keep doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, too, it's not always about money. I mean, I mentioned how someone will give me access to a building or a situation or just, you know, help me out and without even asking anything. And then I'll send them the high res photo going like, thank you very much. Please use this commercially, whatever you like. Sure. I know some photographers will hate me for that and they can just go away because I can't be bothered. But, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not talking about just giving away the work and all that stuff. That's a whole other discussion. But they, that's where you gain the value of community. You make new friends, people, you get along, You it connects more. And I mean, on a personal level, if you even want to stay mater materialistic about it, I swapped two days of uh, taking product photos up in a bike shop in the Netherlands for my first recumbent. It's like a 1500 euro machine, but it's the bike that I wanted and it rides like lightning. <laughs> yeah, value is found in, in a lot of different places. And, and and the big argument that people have against giving away the work is that it devalues it. And so if you're going to use the word value, you better define it. And hopefully your definition is broader uh, than simply that it be, you know, X amount of money for X amount of time, because that's always a losing proposition. Trading money for time is, is always a, a bad idea. But if you can look at value as a bigger thing, I, I think everyone wins. And that's for me, that's what it's got to be. It's got to be a win-win. It's got to be everyone is richer because of the exchange. If that can happen, it doesn't matter whether it happens with money or with bartered goods or time or access or goodwill. There's a or just lot goodwill. of ways. Yeah. yeah. Smiles, happiness, joy into this world a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Man, this is also, jeez, oh, I could just go about this all day. <laughs> <laughs> into into like expressing for yourself into just the whole oh man i'd love to play chess with you sometime uh, uh, it would be a very short game yeah well you'd kick my ass because i haven't played since i was 10 i i i don't play chess so i prom i promise you it would be i'll just drink the whiskey and watch you move the pieces around how's that okay deal deal and if you get over to bruges we'll throw in some belgian beer meals the whole thing <laughs> love, it. love it good man well like i said i could talk about this all day david and i don't want to keep too much of your precious time you have given so uh so without holding back and actually this is where i have to also just thank you for uh giving without holding back i mean you know i'm gonna big this up at the beginning and end like kevin smith on 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 marvel steroids you really just nail your work uh and sharing it out. And I think, and I think that's also just if, if I can throw a thought in, uh, cause I got to ask you one more question that I ask every guest after that. Sure. I, I think this is also just where people also start to succeed. You know, the universe provides when you give and it's not just about like saying, okay, well, a free shoot there or whatever else. It's just giving and participating and being a part of it. And, and I got to say, man, for my personal inspiration on what, I tune in with your work uh, here and there without trying to corrupt my own. That's part of what I get out of your work. You really affirm people and lift them up. And it's not just about like seeing with a camera or anything. It's about seeing the big picture. It's also where I could talk for an hour about how photographers have these crazy perspectives, but I don't want to take too much of your time. You, yeah. I, I appreciate you. I appreciate your kind words. It, it means the world to me. I, I, I try to be as generous as I possibly can. Not, not because I'm going to get something, but because I think if we're all just giving, you know, if we're all putting our work out there and creating impact, the who knows where the ripples go, right? And, uh, and I, I think it's it makes the world a beautiful, a more beautiful place when there is, as we've talked about, there is so much chaos and it is such a challenge to do what we love and, and you know, to to do it in a way that, that we're, is authentic to us. I mean, our lives are not that long and uh, God help us that we should spend that time, you know, not doing something in which we find find meaning. So I uh, very much appreciate you giving me the chance to be here with you today. Amen. Um, when you said it was an honor to be on the show in the mail, it was truly my honor to reply with my honor. <laughs> All right. Well, enough of this or it'll get all soppy and stuff. And then we'll probably end up talking over whiskey. And it's already well, it's late here in Europe, but it's early there in Canada. So I'm sure you're uh, <laughs> your wife won't approve. I'm, I'm a few hours away from my first whiskey of the day.
Oh, okay. Fair play. Fair play. Well, David, uh, we're at the end of our time. Can I squeeze two minutes more out of you? Just ask Absolutely. The, uh, Go for it. Yeah. Uh, oh, you're, you're a star, man. Um, well, David, as I ask every single guest when they join me as Photo Tour Berge up top so I can Rorschach test them on their uh, photo feeling. And I've ended up asking every single guest who drops by this photo life. Simple question. Answer it however you like. How do you feel about your photography? <laughs> I fucking love it. I, I, you know, I, and it's not the, it's not necessarily the photographs. Uh, I, sometimes I make a photograph that just thrills me that I see something and it, it, it expresses the thing I wanted to, to, to see and, and uh, in the final print and, you know, it sums up an experience, or, but for me, it's about the, the making of that photograph gets me into places and experiences and opens my eyes to things that I, I wouldn't otherwise. I'm a very introverted person. I wouldn't have, without a camera, I wouldn't have traveled the world and met the people that I've met and immersed myself in the places and cultures that I have without this craft. And so if nobody else ever looks at another photograph of mine and, and likes it or uh, sees value in it, uh, much as I, I think that would be a, a loss, um, I personally, I love my, I love what I do. I, the experience of it and the challenge of it is, uh, is everything to me. It's not only photography. I find that in writing and I find it in, you know, having a glass of whiskey with a friend. There are other ways of having those deeper experiences, but photography has been the one consistent companion for most of my life since I was 14 years old. And, and I am so grateful. It's such a gift to be able to pick up these incredible collaborative, I mean, these boxes we hold in our hands, they're, they're really relatively stupid, but they really, in terms of a collaboration, the, they can pull the best of us out of us, uh, especially those of us that are, you know, maybe a little introverted or otherwise reluctant to express ourselves. The, the camera is, 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 to me, is a miracle. Wow. That's beautifully said, and I've heard about 2,000 replies by now. Nice, man. That's that's Thank good you. work. Oh, please. Wow. David <laughs> Duchemin on the show, and he's eloquent, and I haven't scared him off halfway, boys and girls. Not Look even at close. that. Not even Miracles close. happen. <laughs> well, good, man. Well, you're welcome on the show anytime. And Thank you. Uh, I, I presume most people can find you since you're not on social media anymore via your website. Please mention for the uh, record. Yeah, well, there's there's a couple places you can find me. You can you can just go to my hub, which is davidduchemin.com, and you will find everything there. But if you're more interested in in the educational resources, craftandvision.com is a place you can find those. And if you just want to listen to my podcast, you can either find me on iTunes or go to a beautifulanarchy.com. And please do, boys and girls, the real purpose behind this podcast is to get all of you to go to other podcasts that are way, way better and structured and make more sense. <laughs> well, they're shorter anyway. <laughs> they're shorter. They're shorter. Yeah, definitely. You got the uh, you got the babble down type, man. Thanks so much for babbling here on this photo live today, David. My pleasure. Thanks, Andy. Woo! There it is. An hour, 16 minutes of David Duchemin and me babbling away. Hope you enjoyed that, boys and girls. I sure as shit did. <laughs> well, I guess I can say that uh, I'm happy I held my own. You know, I tried to uh, step up and not just be, here's a question, talk for 10 minutes. Here's a question, talk for 10 minutes. I wanted to get him on his game. I wanted to throw him a little bit off his game even, but he just kept writing himself like the damn fine creative philosopher he is. And uh, yeah, I hope I didn't embarrass myself and the on the loose format of this show worked well for you because uh seemed to have worked well for David. It worked well for me. And uh, apparently he enjoyed it enough that he'll come back in six months, which I'm all for. Boy, I got questions all the way through. Yeah, so we will uh, revisit David Duchemin at another time. And until then, like uh, you heard at the end of the show, please make sure to check out his work. Oh, and hey, to a shout out to the greater photo podcast community. David is around in the speaking way beyond his own podcast, A Beautiful Anarchy, and this podcast, This Photo Life. I think of note, 
is Baryonyx on the candid frame. Of course, he is rocking it out consecutively. And his chats with David, I think, go especially, especially well. And same goes over for Valerie Jardin on Hit the Streets. They're both friends of the show, so take that as you will. But even if they hadn't been on this show, uh, I could definitely recommend them overall as well for those chats with David. And one more is bonus points in conversation with Jeffrey Sidoris. Oh, such a good podcast overall, probably where I'll also lose some listeners by mentioning others. But uh, his chat with David, I think, especially stood out. You know, it's weird. You, um, you get these creative voices in your head while you're working your own process, like I talked about at the top of the show, and he beautifully, uh, I think, expanded on. But it's just so good when you really get to, uh, to have one that gets in your ear and... On top of it, you know, you get to you get to just connect with them a little further. I feel so, so privileged to uh, have that chat with David and already looking forward to the next one if he's nuts enough to drop by. <laughs> All right, on that note of self-depreciation and Joker-like laughter, let's wrap it up, folks. You know who I am. I'm Andy McSweeney of Andy McSweeney Photography. I'm also Andy McSweeney of Photo Tour Bruges, which is the premium photo tour in Bruges since 2012. Open tours, private tours. Send grandma with the smartphone or you with 10 grand a gear. Somewhere in between, we're here to help. Sorry to do that, but you know the marketing gig that we got to do. Hey, it's there. The link is in the description. There's 15% off for listening to me babble for the last little while, much less throw a plug at the end of the show. And feel free to drop by, you know? It's that kind of thing to do. And on that note of uh, extra Canadianism accenting, I'm wrapping it up. You know what to do from this point on, regular listeners, and I recommend this to you new listeners. It's that time. Get out there and get shooting. See ya!